In today's show, we're taking a look at a beautiful garden that uses art as an essential element of design. That's all coming up next, so stay with us. Over the past 20 years as a garden designer, I've enjoyed helping homeowners create private sanctuaries full of beauty and wonder. I find each garden to be a fresh opportunity to explore ways to create uniquely personal spaces. These are just a few of the gardens I've helped to transform into garden homes. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. Welcome to The Garden Home, a show about garden design and outdoor living. Now, in today's show, we're going to visit a special place. It's one of my favorite gardens in America. It's on Long Island, New York, and it's the home of a well-known textile designer who carries his talents out into the garden and weaves a beautiful masterpiece. Now, this garden is full of bold ideas, exceptional vistas, and some colossal sculpture. Sculpture of many styles can be seen at Longhouse Gardens. Here the goal is to see the juxtaposition of sculpture and the landscape and to be able to experience these art forms firsthand. In today's show, we'll be taking a look at gardens like this one that are trying new and different plants and unique approaches to gardening and art. So let's get started with a visit to a garden in Germany that's overflowing with color and creativity. Whenever I visit a garden home, I'm often struck by the use of a single principle of garden design, such as color. And that's what you see in this garden. Color abounds everywhere you look. Sonia Ziegler is a garden designer whose love of color is equally matched by her passion for supporting local artists. She took us on a tour and showed us why this garden space truly inspires her. Yes, this is my country garden. And in this part of the garden, I mix um, vegetables and uh, annuals and uh, I play with the colors. Yes, I can see lots of wonderful oranges and yellows in here. Of course, color can bring so much to the garden. And one thing that it does is it arrests our attention and can serve as a focal point. But I've noticed in this garden you have other things, uh, objects that serve as focal points. Yes, I have um wood sculptures here in the garden and metal sculptures and um, if you turn left we have a, a spider oh, net, yes. a colored spider net. It's <laughs> very good. And all these uh, things are temporary, it's temporary art. What a great idea as a garden designer to, to bring sculpture into your garden so your clientele can, can see how to use sculpture in the garden very effectively. Yes, and I uh, engaged uh, artists from the region. Wonderful. So local artisans, I've created the sculpture. Yes. And um, it's, that's, that's something anyone can do. They can have their local, local artist create garden ornament and, and use it in their gardens. Yes. This is your design studio here, and you have the largest window in the studio looking out across this beautiful picture. Yes, and it's wonderful to work inside and have the view <laughs> to the garden. I like it very much and um, when I look out I, had a, I have a lot of uh, inspirations and uh, yes, I'm it's, sure. it's wonderful. Yes, what, a, what a vision for inspiration. Color and focal point aren't the only elements of design they've used in this garden to create a sense of fun. For instance, Sonia and her husband Thomas have created this wonderful play area for the children. It's a teepee made out of willow. There's a teepee here that's connected by a long fence that makes a fun hiding place or fort. And there's an entry just to the other side. Now this is made of willow that's cut and stuck into the ground when it's dormant and woven together. And then when spring arrives and they begin to leaf out, it completely covers the teepee and the corral. It's a great way to have fun. Gardens that capture the imagination of children often inspire people to really broaden their creative scope. Even in very traditional landscapes, you'll often find the occasional touch of whimsy, like this garden. It's at Old Westbury on Long Island. This estate is about a lot more than just elegance and grandeur. You see, this was a family home for the Phipps, and they enjoyed it, and you can see elements of humor throughout. A touch of whimsy was important. 
You see, they had four children. They had all boys and one little girl. And when that little girl reached 10 years of age, she was presented with this little cottage. Just look at the authentic thatching for the roof and these massive timbers and stucco that make up the walls. It was a fun place to play on rainy days. Now the garden encouraged children to explore. The plants like lamb's ear, fragrant herbs, and exuberant sparkler like Cleome, or cat's whiskers as they're often called, stimulated their imagination. And the tiny fairy roses, morning glories, and zinnias along the picket fence added so much magic. It's really charming, isn't it? Well, you know, the Phipps were so concerned that the little boys would be jealous of what they had done for the little girl that they built three log cabins for them. Well, you can see who got the better end of the deal. And while children don't necessarily have to have something as elaborate as this to play in, having a space where they can go and play out their fantasies and play make-believe is very important. I have to say, I've visited other kid-friendly gardens during my travels, like the Children's Garden at Earthbound Farms in Carmel, California, where young people get out and try garden-centered craft projects, run through a maze of green, and learn about organic farming. And even the grown-ups have a good time. Birds, frogs, fish, worms, even bats. All kinds of garden creatures are intriguing to kids. In fact, if you're interested in teaching your kids about butterflies, you might want to add one of these to your garden. It's a butterfly house. You see, it can be a source of art in the garden, and it can also be used as a tool to teach the life cycle of the butterfly. You can learn things like where butterflies go during the winter. Well, one butterfly that we all know, the monarch, is spending time away from the cold in its winter home. Ro Vaccaro is a monarch butterfly enthusiast of the first order and she and other friends of the monarchs are dedicated to preserving their winter habitat in Pacific Grove, California. In order to overwinter, there's a split migration. All of the butterflies headed south for a special place that they can survive through the winter. All of the butterflies east of the Rocky Mountains fly 3,500 miles all the way down to Mexico, where there are five wonderful groves north of Mexico City. All of the butterflies generally west of the Rocky Mountains fly to the California coast, and there are five huge locations that are lucky, like us, to have butterfly overwintering trees. How many monarchs do you expect in Pacific Grove this year? Last year and the year before, we had 65,000, so that's probably uh, good, and they are generally sleeping on 10 trees, so you can imagine the, the thickness, it's like orange icing on the branches. It's hard to imagine such delicate creatures traveling so far. No wonder they need their winter rest. Butterflies are certainly a way to add color and life to our gardens, just like the art that we choose to serve as focal points. When I think of stained glass, I think of sunlight streaming through an array of colorful glass prisms, creating a display of light on the ground. Truly a magical, colorful illusion. We visited stained glass artist Judd Mann as he was setting up some of his pieces for a display at a local gallery. Judd tells us a little more about his work. The idea of stained glass has always been to screen or to enhance or to bring beauty from outside to inside. Stained glass will let the colors dance on the floor when the light shines through it. And by bringing those colors into your house, you can then appreciate the colors of nature. With my stained glass, the idea is that you can see through some of it and you can see an enhanced view through some of it, or you can see the color play on the exterior and then appreciate the beauty of that in your home. When I see a piece of glass, if it's a bottle or a plate or a marble, I see the intrinsic beauty in that. I look at that and I realize there's something beautiful in that, something that can be brought into a home and appreciated by everyone. Glass is a way of bringing nature inside, of creating an optical illusion of the garden in your own house. Now let's head back to the Longhouse Reserve to see some of those dramatic sculptures that enhance this landscape. This is a very striking area. It's simple and bold. 
what we have here are 10 Peter Volkow sculptures. And they look like they're made of clay, but they're actually created in bronze. And I love the way they're set in their own sort of gallery space. We have a gravel floor, which is in direct contrast to the dark color of the sculpture. Around the perimeter, we have this clipped hemlock hedge. It's really a great effect. Now, whether you like contemporary or modern style or not, there's some very interesting things to see here at Longhouse Gardens. I think of this garden in much the same way that I like to think about garden homes that I design, a series of experiences that a visitor strolls through. In a garden home, the house is the center with a series of room-like gardens extending or pushing the living space outdoors. A great example is my library with its large windows which open up into the fountain garden. No matter the time of year, I'm able to sit in this room and feel that it's more than just the four walls in the home, but that the garden beyond is an integral part of the experience. In each garden room I design, just like each of the outdoor exhibit spaces here at Long House, the visitor is met with a different feeling, a different experience. In one garden room, the colors might be cool and calm. In another, the setting might be energized with yellows, oranges, and reds. At Longhouse, as you enter into each of the spaces, you find yourself examining the art before you. You begin to feel like you're in a room and that the natural surroundings harmonize with the display. The spaces are generous and give the visitor a thoughtful but playful exchange between man-made art and the art of nature. When you visit the gardens at Longhouse, it's clear that art plays such an important role in the experience. I met with Elizabeth Lear about how sculpture is integrated into the landscape. Elizabeth, this dome is just fantastic. Well, I'm glad that you, you know, appreciate it, but uh, this is Buckminster Fuller's dome, yes. uh, the geodesic dome, and which was an idea in the 20th century for domestic housing. But uh, here at Longhouse, it's really a sculptural um, object. And I think that what it accomplishes is if you were to uh, frame the view, almost using you know a circular frame like a camera lens like a camera lens right. and it calls attention to the wider landscape beyond yes as you move around you see little framed pictures all exactly. the way exactly and i yeah. love the way the the shadows create the shapes and forms on the ground it's very playful you know as a garden designer i find that placing sculpture in the landscape whether it's large or small can be tricky business Elizabeth went on to tell me that with this being a circular space, the scale of the sculpture was very important to the landscape. A circular object like this allows a designer to engage in repetitive thinking. This sculpture of double black circles positioned a few yards beyond the dome also repeats this theme. In other areas of this garden in which sculptures are sited in the landscape, vertical elements are introduced but still using the design technique of repetition. Here at Long House, they haven't just placed art in the garden, but the garden itself has become art. Obviously, the scale and size of this garden requires the dedication of many talented people. To get a better understanding of the layout of the garden, let's step over here and have a visit with Marla Gagnum. So Marla, how did this idea of the Longhouse Gardens come about? Jack originally owned Roundhouse, which was next door here, and this property was all part of that. And he decided to develop this one and build Longhouse as opposed to Roundhouse. In the beginning, it was virtually undeveloped in terms of the gardens. Um, but before Jack built Longhouse, he built the red alley with the cedar posts and the red azaleas and berberis and all those plants that do their thing at different seasons of the year. And then he also did the earthworks, which is the amphitheater. And the first time I ever came here was when Longhouse was just a construction site and the house itself was framed. And you could see basically what it was going to look like, but around it was just mounds of sand, which eventually became the sand dunes out in front. I, I didn't 
have any idea that Jack was going to have such a marvelous inspiration for using all that sand. When you look from the house out into the garden, uh, there are elements in the landscape that really help extend the architecture of the building out into the garden. Well, for example, the, the long hedge here goes from, from the house. It frames this whole area with the pond and the foreground there and the, all the lotus. It's a very strong horizontal line and that helps pull the whole thing together in this area of the garden. There's so many different areas to this garden. And it's divided into a series of garden rooms, really sort of, I guess, garden experiences. Exactly, exactly. Are there certain areas of this garden that have become favorites of yours over the years? This part right here is one of my most favorite. It's open, it's lovely with the boulder sculptures down at the end. And then if you look this way, you have the lotus pond, which is spectacular with when the lotus are all in bloom. and millions of frogs over there. Yes, it feels very tranquil here. You know, Marla, I have to say that Longhouse Gardens has to be one of my favorite American gardens. There's always something happening here. Right. Yeah, well, every year several artists have exhibitions here and some of the pieces stay for a long time and others float on out to other exhibitions. But the Dale Chihuly, for example, has been here, well, I guess his first exhibition here was probably 10 years ago. Well, those pieces really illuminate those spaces. I know, that cobalt blue with the light shining through it. It's, it, it's as if the light comes from within. And this year, um, there are other new additions to the garden. There's a sculpture garden, and in the sculpture garden, the pieces change. But this year, there's some wonderful ethereal bells over there. You'll have to have a look at those. I've seen them. I've seen them. They're really fantastic. It really pays to come back. Absolutely. You'll have to come back next year and see what's happening around here then. There's sure to be something else. I'll do it. Relatively speaking, Longhouse is a new garden. Now this garden, by contrast, is quite old. Stepping into the landscape at Chatsworth in England, you're truly walking into a rich and diverse garden with a history that's over 400 years old. It's certainly full of amazing statuary, fountains, and vistas, but what's really exciting to a garden history buff like me is that many characters have passed through this place over time. For instance, the English novelist Daniel Defoe, author of Robinson Crusoe, said of Chatsworth that it is indeed a most glorious and magnificent house. Now this was back in 1726, and I have to tell you, the house and grounds have changed considerably since then. Simon Seligman, a spokesman for the estate, tells us a little bit about the history of Chatsworth, and especially the work of the 11th Duchess of Devonshire. Well, Chatsworth is a lot of things to a lot of different people. I mean, primarily, it is a great building a family home. It's been the same family's home for 450 years. So there's this amazing sense of continuity in this particular place. Um, a lot of people come here to see a wonderful art collection, but probably as many are coming to see the garden because the house has got this landscape that has evolved around it and grown and developed and been enhanced by so many different generations of the family. And in the course of our season, which is seven months every year, we get about 480,000 people visiting and paying to look around the house and the garden. Uh, but then we also have the park, and one of the unique features of the park here is that it's a thousand acres of this beautiful landscape, open completely free all year round. And we reckon that probably up to half a million people make use of it for free. So that's why I mean Chatsworth means a lot of different things to different people, sure. because you know there aren't many great houses which are that genuinely welcoming and yes. say this landscape is for anyone to enjoy. Tell me about the Duchess's influence on this garden. What, what sorts of things has she added since she's been the Duchess here? The Duchess has had a huge influence. Her real contribution is the grand design, is this sense of scale. It's a bravery in um, not being intimidated by this historic landscape because, you know, to arrive here in 1950, inheriting, you know, one of the most famous gardens in this country already, 
where Paxton and Capability Brown have worked, you might just think, well, there's nothing for me to do. But far from it, they've added on such a scale, Serpentine Hedge, the Chiswick Parterre, um, the Cottage Garden, the Kitchen Garden, um, many other things that I'm, sure. you know. Sure. Well, not only, of. yeah, well, not only would the history be intimidating to someone, but I think the sheer scale of the garden. Absolutely. Um, you can't sort of plant something that's going to be sort of small and miserable. You know, you have to do things on a grand scale yeah, or, not, or not at all. Yeah, absolutely. Things like the limes, the pleached limes on the South Lawn. For kind of 15, 20 years, apparently, they just looked ridiculous. The, the wires that they were trained along were bigger and than more the plants than the plants themselves. Right. But here we are 50 years on, and they've now reached the height she wants, as has the serpentine hedge and many other things. I've always admired the, the serpentine axis up to the Six Dukes bust mm. that she designed. I mean, that's her, her work. Yeah, she saw a, um, a crinkle-crankle wall around a kitchen garden a few miles from here, made of stone, and thought, that's very elegant serpentine shape, but clearly a wall in the middle of the woodland part of the garden would have been out of the question. So it was this idea of recreating it using beech hedges instead. So I think it's that sense of continuing to think boldly and um, vigorously about the landscape, not being intimidated. Um, there are lovely eccentricities as well. You know, she adores chickens and rare breeds of chickens. So there are the wonderful buff cochins going around with their fluffy legs and the public love them. And most gardens have peacocks, but we have chickens. <laughs> right. Which is a very nice touch. Which, right, and it reflects the personality of the owner. Very much so. And that, I think, is another important point, is that, you know, it is home. Um, and difficult though it is sometimes to imagine this enormous building being someone's home. Without this family, it would never have been built. This garden wouldn't exist. It is, has always been a place where big personalities have expressed themselves. And I think this Duke and Duchess have lived up to that. Now, it was the sixth Duke of Devonshire who really encouraged visitors to the estate. And it is this tradition that seems to have been passed down through the generations of the family. I had an opportunity to visit with Deborah, the current Duchess, and she spoke of the joy it brings to have visitors in the house and garden. You came to this house and began to create a garden, you and the Duke, um, some 50 years ago. Yeah. How did it feel coming to this place? And, and creating a garden here, did you ever feel like you were stepping on the toes of ghosts? No, because when we came here, we were both 30. And then you think you can do anything, can't, don't you? <laughs> Move boldly. Don't you think? Yeah, absolutely. When you're that age. <laughs> One of the things that I find that is so appealing to a place like Chatsworth when I visit is that you have people here having a wonderful time and they come from every walk of life, and they're all ages. Yes, I hope they do. I think people like the freedom here, because there's no notices saying no games, no prams, no cameras, no picnics. They can do what they like, and people picnic on the front lawn, and nobody says go away. They can play football there, and nobody says go away. And that's quite unusual in England. I think most of the English are so bossy, they like telling everyone <laughs> what to do. Right. But here yeah, they can do what they like. Well, it just uh, it speaks to the spirit of, of what you and, and um, His Grace have brought here. You and the Duke have made a, a lasting impression on this place. How would you like to be remembered? I know how he would like to be remembered, by his crocuses. And I've, I've always gone for bigger things, maybe more architectural designs and everything. So with the, with the two of us, we've got a bit of both. Well, thank you so much for having me here at Chatsworth. Well, it's been a pleasure. It's been marvelous. And um, I, I can't believe the change I've seen in the past 15 I'm years. I'm very glad if you yeah. think it's all right. Good. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Pleasure. Well, that's it for today's show. Isn't this an amazing place? We've seen some bold ideas, beautiful vistas, and some amazing modern sculpture. Until next time, from the Garden Home, I'm Alan Smith.